Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Jonathan Nicholson with ISP Supplies. Welcome to the CBRS What You Need to Know webinar hosted by ISP Supplies, Biocells, and Alpha Wireless. We have a lot of information to cover. Uh, topics include SAS, GAA and PAL licenses, CBRS radio and antenna solutions, and much, much more. We're hoping that after today's webinar, all of your CBRS questions are answered and everyone knows what to expect. We have quite the panel of expertise with us today. Cameron Kilton from Alpha Wireless, Ronald Mao from Biocells, and Dan Ortega from ISP Supplies. They have prepared a lot of uh, informative slides to share. And at the end of the webinar, we will also address any questions that may come in, as well as announce a special Biocells Alpha Wireless bundle offer. If you miss any details today, and for those who were not able to make it, we will be posting a recording of this webinar on YouTube and all over social media. To help get us started also, uh, we have Dan Ortega. Uh, he'll be uh, making the first presentation today. Welcome, Dan. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you all for um, taking time out of your busy week to join our, um, our webinar. Uh, my name is Dan Ortega. I'm the sales engineer slash sales here at ISP Supplies, and I'm going to be walking you through the CBRS portion of this presentation. So ultimately, I want you guys to think about this is just going to be a high-level overview. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the time. We're not going to be able to. Um, um, we're not going to be able to give you guys a full, fully detailed um, scenario of everything that we have going on here. I just want to make sure that you know you guys have a, a good idea here with stuff. Anyways, oops. Actually, you know what? I want to I want to change the screen that I'm sharing. I apologize. For one second. Sorry, guys. All right, let's see what we got here. All right, that should be better here. Sorry about that, guys. Anyways, okay. So as as we go down this, you know, um, actually, one couple too many slides here. So I want to give you a high level overview. So we look at the market opportunities, and we're going to talk about the tremendous opportunity that's in front of us. Um, I want to clarify some of the CBRS things. You know, what's good about it, what's new, what's different. Um, basically, debunk a lot of the CBRS stuff going around. Um, we're going to talk. You know, some about some of the moving pieces, look at the spectrum acquisition, the FCC regulation, you know, the spectrum access control, how those pieces all work together and how you can benefit from that. We're going to also take a look at the ongoing branding. Um, they're doing a great job at driving this forward, but that's basically the CRS Alliance, is, you know, what they're branding. Some um, case studies and use cases, if you will. And I want to spend a little bit of time so I don't think it's enough. Uh, time that's been going around uh, specific on uh, CA certificate authorities and um, CPI professional certified professional installers. Kind of clarify that for you all. If you look at getting ready for commercialization. You know, what are the vendors doing? You know, what are you doing? Um, how are you going to position yourself to get a piece of this this pie? You know, how can you benefit from this? Um, and then also the good old uh, alphabet soup, um, the acronym glossary. Um, we'll go over that you know, real briefly towards the end here. So when we look at the market opportunities here, you know, when you're looking, you know, at the graphic to the right here, in less than, you know, four years, you're looking at $750 million. So that's a huge chunk. Um, so that's just the scope of the potential opportunity here. Um, you're looking at 41% of all the initial or the, the first opening commercial deployments are going to be fixed wireless, which I'm assuming the majority of you guys on this call are going to be um doing some fixed wireless stuff and another interesting um stat i've seen is the small cell forum forecast that licensed and unlicensed shared spectrum is going to count for over a third of all small cell deployments you know by 2022 so that's just to give you a scope of the opportunity that's at hand here so when you look at stuff you know what is the cbrs the cbrs um is the acronym again that stands for uh systems broadband radio service so in essence, it's, um, 
3550 to 3700 megahertz the spectrum that's been allocated by the FCC for public use. Um, what's unique about it is it's a shared spectrum methodology. It's a three tube system kind of developed by the WinForm and the CRS Alliance. So if you look over to the graphic on the left there, it gives you kind of a visual hierarchy of, of how this is gonna go. So your incumbent layer, your priority or PAL access layer, and then your general authorized access layer, which majority of everyone's gonna be deploying in GAA. And we'll get into more details as we go here on that. So when you look at um, the Wireless Innovation Forum and the CBRS, you know, let's talk a little bit about those folks. Um, so the Wind Forum is the official FCO with multiple committees, but the most important one that's really relevant to what we're talking about today is the SSC, the Spectrum Share sharing committee so they're handling all the part 96 rules and whatnot and working with the government FTC, etc what's nice or keep this in mind is this is definitely technology agnostic um granted many of the members on you know within their committees are all lte but technically doesn't have to be lte so just keep that in mind so they're developing requirements for the sas the cdsc um ESCs, security methods um, and certification um, processes and standards. So they're doing a good job at all that. When you look at the CBRS Alliance, what they are doing is they're building on what the WinForm has been defining and they're doing a good job. So the CBRS Alliance is definitely more, uh, definitely pro LTE and they're driving forward the um, technical specs to support different LTE deployments when you're looking at private LTE networks, neutral host networks, uh, multi-service operator networks, and how those all kind of work together. And they're also focusing on the LTE coexistence. So they're starting to define, you know, cell roaming, uh, going on and off private uh, LTE networks, defining um, virtual SIM cards, eSIMs, et cetera. So, which is a good thing because it's gonna help give us some leverage against the carriers as we go down this path. But um. They're doing a great job of, of driving those things forward. So when you look at some of the differences, um, ultimately it's, it's an extra 100 megahertz of spectrum. So again, we're talking 3550 to 3700 megahertz. Um, 3GPP has defined band 48, um, which would be LTE, um, as the CBRS band. So when you hear the term band 48, that's what they're talking about. But again, it, the unique part about this is it is a shared spectrum approach, meaning that you, know, you have government entities, license holders, and general users all in the same spectrum. Um, but basically, the um, the SAS or the spectrum access system is going to force everyone to play nice, um, which GAA majority of people are going to deploy in that general authorized access. Um, that is really, it's licensed by name only. Um, and it's kind of, there's not a lot of coexistence rules that are defined yet, um, but it's basically you'll play nice in the sandbox, if you will. So the caveat with the GAA is it needs to be, or your hardware needs to be part 96 um, certified. So when you look at like your NN license, so if you have a, a legacy NN license right now, you only have use of that 50 megahertz of spectrum. Um, but when that license expires, you have to make sure whatever equipment you have deployed needs to be Part 96 um, compliant. So, example, if you have a couple Rocket M365s that have been kind of running for years, when your license expires, those are paperweights because there's no plans to make those Part 96 you know, certified. So just keep that in mind when you're developing your business thoughts and how to move your business forward and you know, your model. So we'll get into some more of the details here of the um, of the three-tier spectrum. So again, it's 150 megahertz of spectrum. Um, so when you look at the incumbents, so the top tier, it's gonna be your uh, federal uh, folks in the government, uh, earth stations, fixed wireless, I'm sorry, fixed satellite stations and military. And then there's going to be a chunk um, also for some of the grandfather incumbents. Um, but in general, those it's going to be a pretty nominal number, I think. Unless, you know, if you're on the coast and you're a Navy, a Navy station, that's something to definitely be aware of because you're probably going to have more um, incumbent use than most. But in general, I think that tier is going to be 
relatively low for a lot of the people. When you look at the priority access to so that second tier, um, those are going to be sold per county now. And what's nice about it is if you don't, if you're unable to acquire a PAL license, it's not the end of the world. I mean, even if you had a PAL license, you're still going to deploy under GAA also to utilize the full spectrum. So it's not a deal breaker, just something to keep in mind. Um, they are, the GAA is going to open up before the PAL license uh, and the PAL licenses, the date moves around, but the last date I heard is like June-ish next year is when they're talking about you know, putting them up and starting to auction them, but that number kind of moves around. So just, you're going to definitely be able to deploy a GA before the PAL license side of things. And again, the GA is just that third tier, which you're going to have the full X, the 150 megahertz spectrum minus any incumbents or PAL users um, with that. So when you look at like your old the NN license, again, um, when that license expires, <clears throat> majority of those licenses will expire next April. Um, with that being said, you know, there's a handful of them that might expire, you know, 2021, 2022. So if you have one of those licenses, you know, you can continue to operate with your current, you know, part 90 uh, Z devices until that license expires. But you're definitely limited to the 50 megahertz of spectrum. So if you, like today, if you wanted to deploy in this band, you'd have to have an NN license. Um, and then when they open up GA, then you'd be able to, if your equipment is part 96, you could deploy under the GAA rules and utilize the full spectrum. So just kind of keep that in mind. But again, when that license expires, you know, any of your legacy WiMAX hardware, anything that's not part 96, they're literally paperweights. So keep that in mind as you're um, going down this, this path here. So to give you some of the, the you know, the functional, components of the CRS um, SAS. You hear me say that, you hear a lot of people talk about the SAS. SAS is the Spectrum Access System. So ultimately, it's just gonna coordinate access in the shared spectrum. So it's gonna push down the priorities and make sure that our environment is working as, as needed. Your ESC is gonna be your environmental sensing capability. You know, that's going to help detect some of the incumbent activity and you know, make sure that SAS has the relevant information to assign channels, et cetera. So domain proxy, um, that's a key thing. And Ronald on this call really helped drive this um, at buy cells, but they got that approved. So domain proxy is nice because um, it's mandated that every entity that connects to the SAS must have a CA or a certificate authority. Um, so if you have, let's say, 100 radios, you know, base stations in your network, you'd have to have 100 CAs. Um, if you have, if you're using a vendor like Bicels per se that support domain proxy, you'd only need technically one CA, CA and have all your radios connected to that uh, domain proxy. So that's a nicety and it helps minimize, minimize some of the extra costs that are involved with this. Um, CBSD, another acronym you hear thrown around, in a nutshell, it's just your base station or an LTE terms that you know to be. And we'll talk a little bit more about those in a couple slides ahead. So if you look over at the graphic here to the left, this kind of gives you a visual, you know, you have your domain proxy network manager. So you have multiple radios attached to that, that it will attach to your SAS, just one CA. If you have standalone radios or no domain proxy, then you just need a CA for each of those um, connections. So as we're kind of talking more about you know the basics of the CDRS, et cetera, another term you're probably going to hear is the different categories of the CDSC. So, you know, as defined by Part 96, you know, you're going to have your Category A um, CDSC or radio, which is going to be more like your small cell radio base station. Um, it's going to be less than 30 dB of ERP. Um, so if you if those get mounted below six meters, um, they can be self-installed and do not need a CPI. Um, majority of you, you all on this call are probably going to be doing outdoor, you know, full-fledged, want the full transmit power. So with a Category B, um, you have a maximum of 47 dB EIRP. Um, but those all need to be uh, installed or verified by a CPI. Um, EUD is another acronym, uh, but end-user device. So, you know, 
in a fixed world, it's going to be your UEs and LTE terms or SM, CD, whatever you want to call it, you know, the device that's going on the, the premise, um, all the IoT devices. But one thing to keep in mind is to open the door to the opportunity that's at hand when you talk about standards technology of LTE is the mobile phones. So there's mobile phones that are coming with band 48 radios, like the new the Google Pixel 3 and 4 have a band 48 radio in them. The new Apple iPhone has a band 48 radio. So this band isn't going anywhere. So this is a great opportunity to take advantage of some of the opportunities that are coming. Um, and then you look at the um, the SaaS. Again, it's just going to dynamically enforce the three tiers. And um, it works really well. You know, when it's going to take a little bit of time for everyone to get on the same page and, you know, the vendors, the staff and the operators all kind of get caught up with each other. But when it's all said and done, it's definitely going to be a much better scenario and it's, it's going it's to force people to play nice. Um, and it also opens the door for like, when you look below that, some of the graphics there, you know, private LT networks, you know, whether it's in an entertainment venue, um, the transportation, et cetera. Um, I think the industrial IOT is definitely a big play too. So it just, it opens up again, the door for more opportunity. Um, the graphic on the left is just kind of a high level, just more of a visual again of the different tiers of the, um, the frequency and um, different devices. So when you look at the spectrum access control, so this is just kind of a topology of a, you know, of a said network here. So keep in mind, um, the SAS is gonna be fee based. So, like, for example, Google has announced they're charging $2.25 per um, end user. Again, it's another operating X, you know, cost that goes along with it. But in essence, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be worth the money, I think, when it's going to make you have a better network. But, again, going back to the graphic here, can you look at how they all in intertalk with each other? You know, your domain proxy connecting to the SAS or just your individual radios, but you know, all, uh, you know, all the, the certified professional, the CPI information, the FCC databases and everything, it's all gonna be on the back end kind of coordinated with the SAS. So it's gonna allow for such a dynamic and, you know, a very efficient system that works well. So when we look at, you know, this next slide here, and I hate to even bring up the term 5G, but it definitely, I think it's re relevant information. So don't fall into the marketing hoopla of 5G and all this ridiculous bandwidth and all that stuff. Just 5G essentially is a software defined open RAM. Um, so when you look at it, your access layer is still going to be similar. It's probably be actually sub two gig your frequency because physics are physics. Um, but this, this mid band just opens the door up. You know, if you deploy a standards based technology like LP, like BISELs, LP, we all with BISELs or anyone, it gives you a transition path into 5G if it ever becomes relevant to what you're trying to do. Um, if you're deploying a proprietary like 802.11 based, you know, technology, you, it, there's, there's not a transition path, if that makes sense. But that's, you know, the main thing I just want to touch on. And, you know, it is very relevant, but it definitely opens the door to, to play ball. On Go is basically, you know, CBRS, what they're branding themselves as. And, you know, again, they're doing a great job. So when you look at this kind of graphic here, um, the three big players to assess um, providers are going to be Google, Federated, and Comscope. Um, there's several other phases of SaaS providers um, coming that will, will be coming in, in a phased approach, but those are the ones that are currently going. You know, they are doing uh, the ICD, the initial commercial deployment testing, if you will, right now. Um, and I expect GAA to open up here pretty quickly. Um, if you look at the column to the right, um, Domain Proxy, and these are some of the vendors that support Domain Proxy, um, you know, as of a few months ago. So that's something just to keep in mind as you're looking at your cost and how you want to deploy your network and you know, just trying to get a true cost so you can build your ROI model. But, um, you know, BISO is definitely leading charge of that. And like I mentioned earlier, Ronald has done a great job with really pushing to get that approved. And it, it definitely will make things much easier as we go down this path. 
So when you look at some of the use cases here, you know, majority of everyone here is going to be doing the fixed wireless portion of it. And in a nutshell, the, the LTE protocol allows you to do some non line of sight stuff that you can't do with 5 gigahertz or any of the 802.11 based technology. So obviously that's the, that's the immediate play for you all. But when you start looking at the big picture of things of doing private LP networks, neutral host deployments, or even MSOs, you know, it just there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to take advantage of. And by jumping to a standards-based technology, it gives you an easy transition path, or that option is wide open if you want if you want to go down that path per se. So. Like I mentioned earlier, um, a couple things I want to touch on. You know, you need to know is, yay. Now, who needs a certificate? So, as mandated by the rules, um, all entities, you know, connecting to the staff must have a, a CA. Um, right now, there's three approved uh, CA providers by CRS, uh, Cairo, Insta, and DigiCert. Um, so you just have to keep that in mind as you're kind of going to how you're going to deploy, you know, what your next steps are. And different vendors, some are um, rolling the CA into some of their options. So just realize it's it's something that, needs, that you need to have, and just depends on how it's billed to you or how you end up paying for it, et cetera. But um, that helps out. When you look at the um, the CPI, so a certified professional installer, essentially all they're doing is they're assuring that the information, the data that's entered in the SAS system is accurate. So, you know, if you have a, you know, part 96 radio network up and going, it doesn't mean you need to tear it down and hand a box of parts to the CPI. All they're going to do is, you know, they're going to just verify information that's rel that the SAS needs, you know, um, uh, direction, height, band, uh, beam width, you know, et cetera, stuff like that. Just make sure that information is accurately entered into the SAS system. Um, so one of the questions, you know, that comes up a lot, do you need to be certified? Should you hire certified people? And that's kind of your own prerogative. You got to look at your business model. But yeah, absolutely, you can, you know, it's beneficial to have someone on staff that's a CPI. Um, but if not, it's not a big deal. There's several of them you can contract out to do, to do this. So you just got to look at your your specific um, situation and decide which, which direction you want to go with that. Um, but talk about, you know, some of the categories of CBSDs, you know, um, all the higher power category B radios will need a CPI. And a lot of the, the category A's could need it too, but if they're not below six meters, um, you can go without a CPI and be a self-install for those. Um, end user devices as, Stated, um, do not do not communicate really with the staff in general, and then you don't need a CPI. So you look at you know getting ready for the commercialization here. You know, BuySells has been working really hard. You know, with aligning everything. You know, when you have rules being stated and they change the rules, then they're kind of you know backpedaling to, to be compliant. You know, BuySells is definitely leading the charge of that. You know, and Ronald knows all too well um, some of the um. The, the the changes and you know the things taking but with that being said they're doing a great job of um aligning things and um you know offering a product that's going to be fully comp compliant etc so like i mentioned earlier so they have several deployments um currently going on with the icd the initial commercial deployments which is basically kind of their, their test run but uh, and i expect them to open up ga here pretty quickly here when you look at the transition to CRS, you know, just keep in mind, you know, your license is going to probably going to expire next April. Um, if it, you know, if it doesn't, there's some licenses that go longer, but just take a look and see when your license expires. When that license does expire, you need to jump on board a platform or a vendor that has fully Part 96 compliant devices. So just just to kind of you know give you just a, an idea of you know what what steps you need to take to be compliant as we move down this path. So one thing you know if you want to deploy today, you would have to have an NM license. So FCC is not issuing any new licenses. So if you 
you like I said wanted to play day, you can acquire an MM license secondhand. Um, now you'd have to look at what the cost is and if it makes sense for what you're trying to do. And keep in mind that GAA is going to open up pretty quickly here. So if you're deploying under the NN license, you're technically only using 50 megahertz of spectrum. So you would not be able to utilize a full 150 under the NN license. And, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. You know, we can kind of clarify that, you know, as we go. But um, it just keep that in mind. And when you're looking at um, registering stuff, you can still register your locations. But if you register with the ULF, um, I believe they cut off with, was in 2015 for that um, to get grandfathered in. Then that those locations that you registered back then is what's in the system. But you can still um, update locations now. But with that being said, it just allows you to align yourself with moving forward with GAA fully opens up. So in conclusion here, you know, this is a shared spectrum that there's going to be some, you know, some bumps in the road as we go down this, but as we get up to speed, it's going to work really well. It's going to basically, like I said a couple of times so far, it's going to make everyone play nice. Um, opens up the doors for tremendous opportunity. When you look at, um, you know, the benefit or how can you benefit from CRS, you know, like I said, just look at the opportunities for doing nine line of sight. Just super simplistic. Just not get into the nitty gritty of, of the pros and cons of each technology. You just it'll do nine line of sight. Now after that, then you can start looking at different. You know, look at some of those use cases we're talking about. How do they apply to you? How can you maximize your ARPU and you know raise your revenue numbers based on these new rules. So, with that being said, it kind of just opens the door for that. So this here is um, our acronym glossary, and um, ultimately, I'm not going to go through every single one right now, but I can send out a copy of this to everyone um, on this webinar, so they have all this information at hand. And you know, definitely feel free to reach out to myself or you know Jonathan or anyone here to answer any questions. You know, specifically, feel free to type them in the chat window. We'll try to answer them at the end of this um, presentation. But um, without further ado, I'd like to hand things off to Cameron and let him talk a little bit about um, Alpha and some of the stuff they're doing and how it's going to enable you to take advantage of this stuff too. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon to those on the East Coast. Um, my name is Cameron Kilter. I'm Director of US Sales for Alpha Wireless. Uh, we'll go through a little bit more of the CBRS antenna alignment and selection that kind of exist um, and uh, kind of roll right through what we are doing, where Alpha Wireless has been in the 3.5 spectrum. Uh, Alpha being founded in Ireland some uh, over a decade ago has kind of cut their teeth on 3.5 and WiMAX and has been a focus area for them for well over a decade and have a pretty significant portfolio of 3.5 antennas kind of help round that out. So with that access, um, that express, we have been established in 2007, based in Ireland. You can see we have quite a significant amount of customers that are in the tier one space. Uh, obviously ISP supply is a big customer of ours as well to help solve the fixed wireless uh, solutions we're looking at here in the US. We have over 200 customers in 40 countries, multiple tier one operators who work a lot with fixed wireless. It's kind of my responsibility for the US market. And we really focus on uh, uh, trying to close that uh, that rural broadband gap with some of our antenna solutions. As you can see, we have a full portfolio of, that you'd expect of kind of a, um, an OEM that works the tier one uh, space. Not only we have you know canisters, we kind of come to known as Omnis, uh, our concealment solutions, panels, and obviously small cells. Kind of a history of you know, the transition of base station networks as we get into where we are or where we were to where we're going. Uh, this is kind of the legacy systems as we have grown up over the last couple of decades and how everything kind of came out of a big base station chassis and sitting inside the hut with significantly large coax. Some of us has probably been in the six miles game where you're familiar, you know, using LMR 1200. And certainly uh, LMR 600, 900, things of that nature, trying to get those uh, old frequency hopping 2.4 gear or Onoroco APs up and going up on tower some, some time ago. I know I don't miss working with that coax. 
we kind of all started uh, with vertical vertical polarity omnis sectors. You know, a lot of us were deploying. You know, very often I would say omnis to start things out with, and we kind of grew up to sectorizing on 120s and and even more so, you're getting into smaller and smaller uh, sector vertical beam widths or horizontal beam widths rather, you know, 90 and 65s, and even down as much as 33. Then uh, we start seeing dual pol polarized antennas come mostly into this market. I would say probably mid 2000s we started seeing some uh, dual polarized antennas. Then we started seeing flying at 45 or plus minus 45. You'll see in the uh, the, um, the mobile world. And of course, as evolution has continued to go, we've seen multi band antennas. Obviously, Alpha does a lot with that. You know, high capacity. Capacity MIMO, not just two by two. We're looking at four by four, eight by eight MIMO antennas, and of course, beam forming solutions that you've seen with some of the um, the biggest antenna manufacturers out there. And we're no different. We do a lot with beam forming as well uh, when you get into the the larger MIMO counts. So this kind of looks at the past, as I mentioned, with the the base station, big heavy coax, moving up to amplifiers, up to passive antennas to kind of where we are today, um, where we're seeing the radio and all the intelligence sitting up on the tower, very short coax, the smaller coax diameter, you're working with half inch, three eighths, and in some cases you see people deploying quarter inch uh, coax jumper cables to the radio, uh, particularly now with Bison Solutions, we have a, you know, the DC and, and uh, data cables up on the tower. We're able to run very short coax jumpers, really reducing a lot of the load that exists on a lot of the towers that we have come to know to uh, love and hate in this market as far as what we deploy. Then moving on into uh, what we're seeing now is more and more active antenna solutions where we're building the antennas directly into the radios as well to uh, add additional functionality and control as you get towards that uh, the 5G mindset. So a lot of things that we want to look out for um, from an antenna perspective is we really want to focus on what are we oh something interesting happened there um, what are we focusing on from a network design what do we need to design the network for and a lot of you have attended uh, many of my classes in the past and I, I really focus on designing your network for what you need it to do um, and really stick to it you know, if you're designing it to cover three or four miles don't install customers that are six and seven miles away. You know, that's just gonna cause problems for you later on the road. And all that comes down to making sure you're selecting the proper gain, the proper um, um, beam width for the antenna, making sure your front to back ratio is gonna be appropriate for the amount of antennas that you have on a given site. And all those factors are gonna come into a well-designed uh, engineered location for you to provide your service to your customers. And a lot of you have seen this um, expression a lot, you know, worry about upper side lobes and kind of what the impact and the side lobes in general. Uh, we've, we've heard that term a lot over the last couple of years. And some of the stuff that we see with non-optimized antennas is kind of the, the diagram and the, the photo on the right and what you can expect to see on some of the lesser quality antennas that are on the market today. Then you look at what we have done with some of our optimized antennas on the left-hand side is we kind of do a lot of the null fill which gives us a lot better near near um, cell site coverage. So we don't shoot over the top of, of customers and really effectively decreasing the amount of coverage we get out of site. I know everybody really appreciates a good 3D pattern. So here's some of the, what our optimized antennas look like on the left and a non-optimized unit on the right. And this is our fancy graphic for the presentation right here. We got a little bit of flashing, but you can see where the the, uh, the optimized antenna, particularly that green arrow, really gets in close to the tower, uh, where you get a little bit of concern. And typically speaking, you have to be worried about the uh, the coverage of only being in that uh, that kind of the orange yellow colors where that main beam would focus. Sometimes giving you a little bit of uh, poor coverage in the near area. And one thing to worry about as well, as you see in that blue flashing line, is you got to worry about your upper side lobes. And depending on how well you design your engineer site, that, that is where you get a lot of self-interference issues with sites at a distance where you're shooting a little bit uh, further out. But 
um, as you see here noted, good antenna design should reduce all of your upper side lows by at least, at least 18 dB below the peak, reducing that uh, risk of self-interference. There's a lot of our typical test results. You know, every alpha antenna that kind of comes off of that uh, comes off our production line has been recorded with all this information. So should you actually want to know what your testing results are for the antenna, you actually can contact me or anyone at Alpha Wireless with a serial number and we'll be able to provide you those results. So at any time if you're curious for how your, your VSWR is rated, um, if it's a PIM rated antenna, we can tell you what the PIM results were. All that stuff is recorded into a central database that we keep track of. And every antenna is independently verified and tested before it's packaged to chip. So going back to the, the design component of this, and our, one of our more popular antennas, uh, particularly for LTE market, is the 65 degree antenna. And this is kind of an example of how we measure the power. And this is really no different than others that marry on, uh, measure their power on the 3 dB beam width. So we're essentially, how much coverage do we have at half power? So we have um, 63.53 degrees of coverage at the 3 dB half, so half power. Uh, at the azimuth cover uh, determining this is exactly what our beam width is and looks like. And we have other information down here is, is similarly controlling with the elevation or the vertical beam width. Front to back ratios. Now this is something that, that comes across often and is very important, but it's also important that it's it's measured appropriately. A lot of spec sheets you'll see out there will be a little kind of a, a misnomer in the sense uh, they'll guide you in the wrong direction. They'll give you this ridiculously high front to back ratio, but they're measuring it directly at 180 degree off the bore site. Now that's all well and fine. However, a standards body for antennas and particularly that work in 3GPB compliant deployments, they measure off the plus minus 30 of 180. So you go all the way up to 210, all the way down to 150, and you take the, the average of that, and that's your, your true front to back ratio to make sure you're gonna get uh, the best possible front to back ratio across the, the across the pattern. Uh, another good thing you want to look for is a cross pole discrimination. Now this comes up a lot. People can ask you, what is this? And what we see a lot of in some of the lower quality antennas is a very low cross pole discrimination, say somewhere between six and seven dB. We kind of want you to liken that idea of separating the multiple input, multiple outputs of the MIMO component. Let's, let's start with just two by two for simplified discussion. What only having a seven or eight dB uh, cross pole discrimination means is that's all that the antenna is able to separate the two separate streams that are coming out of radio. Ours are closer to 14. So we're able to uh, essentially, we double that discrimination, allowing for a higher modulation across uh, the deployment scenario because our cross pole discrimination is so much more enhanced comparing to some of our competition that's on the market today. And that's, that's the number you want to pay close attention to because that can make a difference between an MCS of say 20 to 22 and an MCS all the way up to 28, effectively doubling your cell site capacity. Now, early on in, in my career working both with buy cells and with Alpha, I've been really preaching the importance of, you know, proper tilt selection for the deployment. Now, on the left-hand side, kind of, this is an actual um, diagram of what you would see if you adjusted too much tilt mechanically and what the pattern does as you make those adjustments. So, for example, the blue line on the left-hand side represents, you know, T0. This is the, the antenna has been installed. At zero degrees down to all is well with the world. The red line starts to see, I think this is about three and a half degrees of down till, and you can see the pattern does change. However, it's still pretty consistent overall. Then you start getting pretty dramatic changes in the pattern, which we call blooming, when you get above that four degrees of down till, and you can see it gets significantly worse with the way the pattern coverage is working, as well as the front to back ratio starts to get thrown off. Now, that's where it's important if you are going to use a fixed tilt antenna that you're selecting an antenna that's as close to the tilt electrical down tilt requirements that you need uh, as possible. That's going to give you the best possible RF coverage by selecting that. Now, if you're using some of our mechanical uh, antennas, you'll see this pattern on the right as you're able to adjust from zero to 10 degrees of down tilt and you see the pattern essentially uh, identical across the entire tilt range. 
it just pulls it in electronically. And also by doing it electronically, you do not jeopardize the front to back ratio of a cell. Now, I've seen this question come up a few times recently on WIF Talk on Facebook and a few other groups people are asking about, and we've recently announced one of our newer 33 degree antennas, and people are asking, well, why 33 degree antennas? Well, the cell site capacities are going up, the customer demands are going up, we need to push more megabits per second to the end user. So we've been doing a lot more with six sector deployments using 33 degree antennas across the band, allowing for an even N equals one, so a frequency release of one, for those devices that share a common baseband, particularly an LTE. And for those who don't, we've been doing an N equals two reuse, where essentially you've got an ABC, ABC sector configuration, allowing for optimal uh, site capacity, where essentially every frequency is gonna be in a front to back scenario. So you have north and south will be one frequency, um, east or, or northwest, southwest would be two different frequencies, of that sort of thing. Now on the tilt that we we're talking about just a moment ago, this kind of is more of a graphical representation of what you would expect to see from a physical standpoint. As we have our, our fixed electric tilt models, you'll see a lot of that. They either start with a T0, which means they have zero degrees electric down tilt, or you'll see T4. And then we have our mechanical electrical tilt, which is essentially um, an electrical tilt adjustment screw that's on the bottom that lets you know what your tilt range is. And you can set that just by adjusting a screw and that, that will modify the electrical tilt of the antenna using our phase shifter technology. Then we have ERET. So ERET is enclosed remote electric tilt. Uh, we basically have a remote uh, system that can be run from your desktop or a handheld controller at the base of the tower should you run a cable up. Uh, and you can actually daisy chain the antennas and control them independently. And that allows you to make remote electrical tilt adjustments without having to send a climber up the tower. Obviously, those antennas cost a little bit more, but it's going to come down to kind of more of a business decision. How much does it cost you to send a climber out? And you can even control these with network-based controllers, so you can actually make the adjustment right from a desktop, or you could have at least a cable coming down. It can be done with a handheld tool. And this is kind of what the difference you can expect in a pattern between a mechanical adjustment. You can see how the pattern is all over the place on the top right. And you can see what it looks like with an electrical adjustment when we really focus the pattern, we keep it down where the customers are. And particularly that front to back ratio, you can see in the top right is this shooting further, further up, which means you could cause self-interference to yourself. So go figure. There's kind of a combination of both. We have some situations where we have customers that are on significant mountain peaks shooting down into a valley even at 10 degrees electric down tilt is not enough. So they still need to put on a little bit of mechanical. A little bit of mechanical is okay. It's just, you don't wanna to try to do, you know, more than four essentially is what I tell anybody. If you're going much more than that, uh, you're risking uh, some pattern blooming and, and potentially causing yourself some risk there and hurting your overall capacity. This is an example of kind of the phase shifter technology that we do inside of our antennas. Uh, you can see the different loop positions and, and what they kind of look like um, and what they do to the pattern above that. So you can see at T0 what that pattern looks like with a null fill, and you see what it looks like at a T5. And you can see that the pattern continually comes down, but it's relatively consistent, and the same goes with, uh, with T10. This is kind of a cost comparison on what you can expect to see across the... Uh, uh, the choices of antennas, whether it be fixed, mechanical electrical tilt, or remote electrical tilt. And you see fixed tilt is obviously less expensive. Mechanical electrical tilt, you know, adds uh, adds some cost, usually a couple hundred dollars per antenna. Then when you jump to E-Red, it does jump up to a few hundred dollars more per antenna. But you got to weigh out those costs. Some of you guys contract out tower crews. Some of you have in-house crews. So every, every formula is a little bit different. Uh, and some work better than others. So it's one of those things you take into consideration. But one thing I try to tell a customer is even if you have your own tower crews, if they're climbing to fix something, that means they're not climbing to build something else. So that's a cost you really should keep in mind as well. I've been talking about this for an awful long time is the antenna, over, uh, antenna pattern overlap and wider is not always better. And you kind of heard me probably say in some, in some classes some years ago is treat 65 like 90s, 90s like 120s, 120s like 180s and so on. 
And that's not necessarily always the case, but don't ever think of an antenna, particularly sectors antennas or panel antennas rather as, as pie slices. Now there are some exceptions to that rule, which I'll kind of get to a little bit later, but for the most part, they do have significant overlap. All the major tier one carriers essentially do their coverage based on using 365 degree antennas uh, that cover 360 degrees. Now, mass says that doesn't work. Um, in fixed wireless, I often recommend 65 degree antennas, three of them or four of them, depending on the cell site configuration and um, how much coverage you're trying to go for. Now, all this is answered through a proper RF design using some using some software that can help you determine what antenna is going to be the right antenna choice from you. And that goes back to you wanting to, to design your network for what you needed to do. Are you going to go for four miles? Are you going to go for 14 miles? There's a significant difference in antenna selection based on what you're trying to accomplish. Now, we've, we've kind of all heard, you know, Omnis never use Omnis. Now, there is exceptions to that rule. I'm a firm believer that every antenna has a use case. That doesn't mean um, you should single any one antenna out. And generally speaking, Omnis are a good way to get into an area. If you're looking to hit 20, 30 customers, maybe even less. Uh, don't want to you know, spend all the money to centralize the site to start that out with. Completely understand. So what we kind of came up with was a pseudo Omni, which each 120 degree slice of this antenna, we can address the down tilt um, independently. So you may have one section that's you know relatively level. You don't you have to minimally adjust the down tilt. You may have another 120 degree slice that's shooting down into a valley. You could drop that down to as much as minus 10 degrees. And and same with that third section. You can tune each 120 degree section appropriately uh, for the region. And we have these both in a two by two and four by four MIMO. Uh, configuration. So it supports essentially both the buy cells 233 and the buy cells 436Q. Now antenna backplanes, this is in another reason we run into and we see this often is why slant 45 for instead of HV. So HV backplanes are significantly different. This causes a lot of mismatched chain performance. Now there are some exceptions. For example, symmetrical and asymmetrical horns. Uh, because of their nature and design, they do share essentially the same exact pattern. But in essentially every panel antenna that you look at, you're going to have a difference in gain performance across a horizontal versus vertical beam. As you can see here, kind of to the top right, you know, your vertical beam is in the blue, and this is what your, your gain pattern looks like, and your horizontal beam is in the red. Now, when you go slant 45, because they share a common backplane, they're essentially identical. So you're going to get the same consistent gain performance on both antenna chains. So that is something to, uh, to keep in mind and why slant 45 is more commonly deployed, not only in, in mobility, but it's certainly making its way in the fixed wireless LP model. You're starting to see a lot of slant 45 and other brands are starting to pick up on that. But it's like I said, there is some exceptions to that, such as symmetrical and asymmetrical horns that we see in the market. Uh, they do because of just, again, their nature. Uh, they are the exception, but not the rule. Uh, some of the other uh, alpha antenna stuff that we'll get into is we use stainless steel for all of our uh, bracketry. It does say or hot dip galvanized, but essentially everything is stainless. We do send anti-seize with every one of them, so be sure to use it. Otherwise, that uh, bracket may become a permanent fixture until you get something to cut it off. Uh, we use high performance PTFE substrates and our PCBs uh, to make sure we're receiving good performance. And we have standard connector type options. Essentially, uh, a lot of the antenna connector types you see out there now are N type, uh, but they're better for TIM performance starting October 1st. All antennas shipping from Alpha's factory are starting with 4310, and eventually we'll probably transition to a new connector known as Next 10. Um, which those are not familiar with, it kind of looks like a B and C connector. So it's kind of taken a full turn, but they are, have improved in performance, a little bit easier to handle and requiring less of a heavy duty cable going from, you know, a half inch diameter cable. We can start dropping down to quarter inch and three eighths inch cables uh, to make it a little bit easier to manage on the installation. Now, before I hand off to Ronald, uh, you know, I will say one thing that's going to be very important from an antenna perspective and how it really applies to CBRS is it's going to be very important to record the absolute center line of your antenna installations on your towers. 
it's actually if you're the CPI, it's going to be certifying that your absolute azimuth and your absolute tilts, and that includes mechanical and electrical combined. So if you have a you know a minus four antenna and you put another minus two, you need to report to the SAS that you have a minus six system installed. That all that information and as long as it's in absolute form is going to assure that everybody gets the best possible channel selection. As uh, was mentioned earlier, you know we can transmit out to 47 dBm, and that's just in a 10 megahertz channel. So if you are taking really good care of what you're putting into the database. Um, and you request a 20 megahertz channel, you can actually transmit at 50 dBm EIRP. So you can get even a little bit more power out of the channel assignment that you've been getting sent to you. Now, it's also important for you that if you are deploying networks and you want to reuse the same channel, if you are being sloppy, if you will, with what information you're putting in, you're not taking absolute information down and, and putting it into the SAS, that can be the difference of whether you're going to get assigned a channel that you believe is clean and where it might, may not be. So it's going to be important for the, all that information to be recorded and inputted into the SAS. With that said, I'll hand this off to Ronald and we'll move on. Thank you uh, for the great introduction by Dan and Cameron. Um, I'm going to give some updates on CBRS E-Node-Bs and CPEs. From that that are provided by by cells. My uh, slides are short, uh, three of them. I just wanted to highlight some of the, our products, uh, CBRS related, and how it works with uh, Alpha antenna. By the way, I'm Ronald Mao. I'm uh, been with uh, by cells for two years. My Title is uh, Director of Carrier Solutions. My, I'm involved in pre-sales uh, activities and the product management. And uh, one of my respo uh, responsibilities is to get our products ready for CBRS. Um, I've had the, uh, I'm fortunate to work with uh, both Dan and Cameron at some point because we all uh, were with uh, by cells uh, during the past two years. Um, first of all, the highlights of uh, our e node B. Our we have we, we just I just want to highlight some of the new uh, the uh, features. Of our uh, new 436Q Q stands for Qualcomm. We have redesigned our four port e node Bs using Qualcomm's high performance chipsets. Uh, one thing I would like to highlight is that it is a CBRS, CBRS ready, meaning that it has been recently uh, certified by FCC uh, with the part 96 rules compliant to CBRS. It is uh, interoperable with major SaaS administrators, including uh, Google, Federated Wireless, MDocs, and Comscope. This e node bees will work with two carriers, meaning that uh, when you uh, configure this uh, your cell site with uh, just one cell, and you can you can aggregate these two carriers to support carrier aggregation, give you the maximum amount of data throughput. Or you can split these two carriers into two cells, each cell uh, with their, its own carrier. So this product gives you the flexibility. 436Q is also supporting Halo B, which is on uh, our uh, solutions to have some of the EPC uh, functionalities at the E node B or at the edge. And the advantage of that function is that it allows the E node B to continue uh, providing services even at some point of time when your S1 link fails. And last but not, not at least is that this um, e -Node B works well with uh, alpha antennas because it uh, 
has four ports and that, that allows you to each <clears throat> to either uh, deploy it with a four port antenna or two port antenna each um, serving one sector. Uh, next, I would like to highlight the, the characters of our uh, UEs or CPEs. Uh, first of all, and hardware-wise, we can categor uh, uh, categorize this uh, CPEs into three categories. It's e either indoor or outdoor with low gain or outdoor with high gain. The indoor version is our Atom IDUB model, uh, which you can deploy indoor. It has um, also has uh, Wi-Fi router built in. The outdoor low gain is our Atom ODUL model. It uh, has a built-in antenna with a gain of 14 dBi working on a, a single uh, carrier uh, in the CBRS band. The outdoor high gain model is our Atom ODUH, which uh, gives you a built-in antenna of 19.5 dBi on a CBRS carrier. Software-wise, the UEs can be categorized into UE category 4, 6, or 12 nowadays. Uh, category 4, by definition, is 3GPP release 9 compliant, which gives you a data rate of 150 on the downlink or 50 on the uplink. The, it offers the basic LTE features such as 2x2 two two MIMO. UE category 6, by definition, is release 10 compliant. It uh, doubles the data rate on the downlink compared to UE category 4, uh, which is equivalent to 300. Um, the features on this UE category includes 2x2 two two MIMO, and a downlink to carrier component aggregation, which uh, uh, is used to double the downlink data rate. The UE category 12, by definition, is release 11 compliant. Release 11 is considered LTE advanced. It uh, gives you a it doubles the data rate on both the uh, downlink and uplink compared to category six. Downlink can reach 600 and uplink can reach 100. To do so, it has introduced the features uh, on the MIMO side, it's either two by two or four by four. On the downlink, uh, it supports multiple numbers of carrier component aggregation up to five. And up on the uplink, it supports carrier aggregation as well. On the downlink, optionally, you can, uh, there is a feature of 256 QAM that uh, allows you to increase or boost the data rate on the downlink. I hope the, this clarifies some of the confusions that you guys may have, uh, I guess. Uh, ask about uh, differences between the different UE categories many times. And lastly, I would like to touch up upon the BioCells Cloud Core solutions. Um, BioCells Cloud Core provides EPC and OMC plus BOSS functions. Uh, it um, it is designed to reduce the network capex and give operators options to fastly uh, deploy their network with plug and play uh, capabilities. It is available anytime, anywhere. BiSales manages the EPC functions, operators does not have to do anything about it. 
but option, uh, but operators do have options to sign up to up to manage their, net, their own network through OMC and BOSS by signing up with buy sells with uh, uh, their own account. Halo B enhances the cloud core solutions by duplicating some of the light, uh, the EPC functions at the ENOB level. The advantages is that even when S1 link, which is the link between the ENOB and the cloud core, when that link goes down, user can, can continue to be served. Um, because without Halo B, um, eNodeBees is monitoring the S1 links with the cloud, uh, cloud core. When that link goes away, uh, eNodeB uh, lose the heartbeat and will go down. But this Halo Bees allows you to continue the service. It just makes the cloud core services more, more robust. There are scenarios when operators want to get total control over their network, especially on the EPC side. Uh, and we can offer that capabilities by providing a local core. Uh, local core meaning that uh, operators can deploy the EPC, OMC, and BOSS on their private network hence get total control of their network end to end. There are two options for operators to do that. One is the, the standard deployment, which um, operators can manage a relatively small network at, with the least of cost. And we also have this professional options that allows operators to manage a relatively large networks. With this local core, uh, operate, operators obviously get a, a, a total control of their, of their network. It is um, also useful for operators with multiple EPC solutions or geographically dispersed regions. And uh, operators also can enjoy advanced uh, services that uh, are made available by customizing some of the EPC services. And that's it from me, the, the brief updates of uh, buy sell products. Now I will hand it back to Jonathan. Thank you very much, Ronald, uh, for that great in-depth presentation. And uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Everyone else here on the line, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Cameron and Dan as well for going over all the info there and uh, and such thoroughness. We will also be uh, posting a, a copy of this webinar also uh, to make sure that uh, you know anyone that may have any questions could uh, go ahead and uh, you know uh, have them answered once again. And uh, if anybody missed it, uh, you can go ahead and just. Uh, uh, rewatch the whole webinar. Now we do have some time now left for some. Uh, uh, Q and A, uh, and a few questions did come in. Um, we may have answered some of these questions already in the presentation, but it's fine. We'll go ahead and uh, make the answers almost like a recap, and uh, I will go ahead and open the line so that uh, Dan, Ronald, and Cameron could all go ahead and uh, answer any questions that may come in. So just be a moment here. One of the first questions that came in was during ICDs. Will WISPs be restricted to the use of 3650 to 3700 gigahertz frequency only? No. Okay. And how much additional frequency will be available to WISPs beyond 3650 to 3700 when GAA starts? There's an additional 30 megahertz that are below the 3650, so it goes down to 3620. Now, until ICDs have been issued, the entire 150 megahertz are available. Or not ICDs, but PALs, excuse me. Excellent. 
Now, uh, this next question, with CBRS, how do WISPs coexist? The last thing a WISP wants is to make an investment in CBRS and then have to lose customers when they lose frequency they are transmitting on. It'll be pretty rare you'll be in a situation where you won't be able to get a channel, even if another WISP is in the area, given there being 150 megahertz, but that's where it becomes very important for the absolute metrics that I mentioned earlier to be recorded, such as antenna azimuth, tilt, beam width, all that stuff will come into play um, because what may affect you will also affect them. So if you are recording poor information and they could call you out on it, uh, your CPI could be in jeopardy. So it's gonna be very important for everybody to play by the rules and record their information appropriately, but it's gonna be quite unlikely uh, that if you're in GA only, that you won't be granted some type of uh, available. If you're looking to absolutely secure your investment, I would say look at uh, look at purchasing some pals. Excellent, thank you, Cameron. Another question that came in was, what happens when a WISP is operating in a GA frequency and another WISP with an NN licensed starts operating in the same geographic location? I would ask for um, clarification oh, okay. on that one. <laughs> Is if they're an NN license, sure. they should already be operating. If if you're if you are trying to turn on an NN location after somebody that has CBRS, I don't think you would be within the rules to do that because you are no longer grandfathered. Yeah, before grandfathering <laughs> expires, the NN license will be protected like a incumbent, but that will only la uh, be the case until April 2020. After that, you will have to coexist with every other else. But the SAS should protect, you know, as long as you're registered correctly, you know, the grandfather um, protection zone, et cetera, the SAS should protect that spectrum. Yeah, That's as correct. an incumbent, right. Excellent, thank you. Another question that came in is, what happens when a WISP is operating in a, a GA frequency and another WISP without an NN license starts operating in the same area? It seems similar to the last question. So if if you have if you're operating in GAA with an NN license and if somebody else comes into the area with CBRS, for example, the NN license, if all is registered correctly, as Dan mentioned, will be protected and they cannot transmit on that frequency. They will be given a different frequency. Thank you. A couple more here. What happens when WISPs are operating in unused PAL frequencies, which then later become operational? Um, so there's two parts to that. So there's gonna be situations where an auction has taken place and let's say, just for conversation's sake, one of the carriers won that county. They may only deploy in part of the county. So you'll still be able to use the spectrum that they quote unquote won in parts of the county they haven't deployed. That's the beautiful part of the shared system. However, if they decide to expand in the area you are in the channel, the channels that are um, occupied are full, they may move you to a less occupied channel and give the priority to the purchaser of that, uh, that particular channel. Now, when you buy, uh, a PAL, you are not buying a specific frequency. You are buying a 10 megahertz block somewhere within the 70 megahertz, and that's dynamic nonetheless. They're just guaranteeing you that they're going to give you 10 megahertz. And that's correct. Uh, the SAS manages these channels dynamically. SAS is, uh, when, when, when conflicts does occur, the SAS will find a way to work it around. Beautiful. Thank you. How do the WISPs in the area share the available GA frequency? It's all automated. The SAS is going to determine through their um, their algorithms and all other SASs do talk to each other on what's available in a given area. You, in theory, based on um, all the information provided, you could actually have a WISP on the same exact tower and you guys will get assigned different channels. Yeah, right. I, I, I hear people has a concern that when CBRS is in place, there are going to be a lot of uh, com uh, competing uh, uh, players to for the CBRS licenses. But uh, actually, 
uh, the CBRS has increased the availability or the pool of licenses from 50 to 150. Even when Pal uh, has bought everything that they they can be uh, that are that are optional, there are still uh, 80 uh, megahertz that are available for the uh, GAA license to to work with. Yeah, because even if you have a Pal license, you're still going to uh, deploy in GA. I'd assume to maximize the spectrum available. Right. Great. Thank you. Last question here. During ICDs, will WISPs be restricted to the use of 3650 to 3700 frequency only? No. I think we covered that earlier. You can operate anywhere within the 150 megahertz. That's right. The purpose of the ICD is, is to verify the whole concept of CBRS works, which includes the verification of the availability of 150 uh, megahertz channels. Excellent. Thank you very much. And great. Thank you. This concludes the uh, Q&A section of our webinar. Uh, we do have a promotional offer for everyone attending or viewing this recording of this webinar. The promo bundle includes the Biocell's 436Q base station, a wireless four port sector, uh, low PIM cables, and cold shrink for a promotional low price. Uh, please call ISP Supplies at 855-947-7776 or email us at uh, sales at ispsupplies.com for detailed product and pricing information. Uh, at this time, we would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Our recording of this webinar will be available soon on our YouTube at uh, youtube.com backslash ISP Supplies, as well as social media, including our Facebook page at facebook.com backslash ISP Supplies. So make sure to subscribe and follow us. Have a great rest of your day and great rest of your week, everyone, and God bless. Happy Thanksgiving, and thank you all for joining.